Well, good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Sarah Shookman. I'm an anchor at WKYC Channel 3 News, and I am pleased to be here today to moderate this important conversation about the Cleveland Consent Decree. Well, to, just to review some history here as we get started, in May of 2015, the U.S. Department of Justice announced this settlement, a negotiated agreement with the city of Cleveland designed to dramatically improve and reform relationships between the police department and the communities it serves. This decree resulted from the findings of a DOJ investigation that was launched in 2013 to examine the use of excessive force by Cleveland police. Mayor Frank Jackson and others had called for that inquiry following the 2012 high-speed chase and deadly shooting of two unarmed people, Timothy Russell and Melissa Williams. The findings were released last December, less than two weeks after the police shooting of 12-year-old Tamir Rice. The timing and the findings themselves helped connect the consent decree to that case, a shooting that was recently deemed reasonable by two experts contracted by the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office. All of this is just important context. In the last several months, the city has implemented several components of the consent decree, including the formation of a 13-member Cleveland Community Police Commission and the selection of Los Angeles-based Police Assessment Resource Center as the court-appointed independent monitor. FBI Director James Comey, who was in Cleveland this week, says he's optimistic about the city's ability to bring police and community back together by building trust. Well, today we have three members of that newly appointed Cleveland Community Police Commission with us to discuss how the community can support this difficult work of repairing police and community relations and also what this means for the future of Cleveland. And with that, let me introduce our panelists. Dr. Rhonda Williams is the founder and director of the Social Justice Institute at Case Western Reserve University. She's also an associate professor of history. Craig Boyce is the Dean of the Marshall College of Law and also a former police officer. And Steve Loomis is the President of the Cleveland Police Patrolmen's Association. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Congratulations first off on this new appointment. How are you approaching this new job? Uh, I guess with some trepidation. <laughs> um, uh, with an understanding of the importance of um, the consent decree and um, uh, successfully implementing the provisions of that uh, and, and what the ramifications of that are for the city. Um, it's a great deal of uh, time, um, uh, but as a group, I think that we are uh, uh, gelling and uh, getting a handle on the, the scope of what we're supposed to be doing and uh, are looking forward to continuing. Um, we're, uh, uh, I'm approaching this with a very, very open-minded um, position. Um, I think that there's a lot to learn on both sides of this equation and um, I think that we're going to be able to provide, I'm going to be able to provide some uh, some perspective from law enforcement, from the, the men and women that are in the street, which I think is very, very important for an honest and open dialogue and um, we need all the information we can get to make very good decisions and, and that's what we're going to do, is make very good decisions. So. There's always room for improvement in everything that we do. And uh, I look forward to that opportunity. So I'm approaching it from a, a couple ways, actually. Um, not only the kind of practical ways of how do we get the work done, given the amount of work we have done, how do we think about the deadlines, really trying to manage what we're doing. But I always have to situate myself in a philosophical core and remember why it is I'm trying to do the work in the first place. Mm -hmm. So um, anybody who knows me knows that I can talk. So I have to actually <laughs> provide myself with speaking points so that I can make sure that I'm actually sharing the stage and the floor. So there are four things that help me stay centered. Um, and one of those things is to remember um, and emphasize and think about as we do the work, why it is this work is here for us to do in the first place. So that we have to remember that this comes out of an investigative report on a finding of patterns and practice of, of, of excessive use of force and uh, unconstitutional policing. And so I have to remember um, and, and, and think about this as I talk to community um, and say, this is what we have to focus on. As we talk about this as commissioners, this is what we have to focus on and how does this impact the breadth of the work? So that's one. The other is one of our other broad mandates um, is community police relations, right? And so how do we build community police relations? How do we think about that in the context 
of what the investigative findings were. How do we think about legitimacy? How do we think about confidence? How do we think about building trust? And that's important and hard work, and it's not overnight work. Um, my third thing is that there's always the element of truth. Truth must stand at the center. Um, and so before we can have reconciliation, we've got to have truth. And so that means we have to be prepared to talk about some really contentious issues, and we know that, <laughs> and, and try to move through them and also develop the best um, a set of policies and procedures and make sure that there are real outcomes on the ground for people who um, are encountering um, police every day, and particularly the most aggrieved, marginalized, and exploited and vulnerable. And then the, the final, for me, in terms of, of how I approach the work and, and, and philosophically situate myself, is that I'm a historian. So for me, this has to be tied to a conversation about the history and about root causes and broad, about broader systems of inequality. Bink. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rhonda, keeping it succinct for us. <laughs> so let's, let's start with where is the work of the commission right now? Where does mm -hmm. it stand? Well, we're um, uh, about a month into um, uh, our work. Uh, initially, it was a matter of really familiarizing ourselves with the decree. Uh, with our, our uh, responsibilities under the consent decree as a commission um, and to begin to put in, so in place some infrastructure around how we're going to do that work. So establishing a set of bylaws, um, uh, electing uh, co-chairs of the group, thinking about committees and, um, and how we're going to tackle the different uh, pieces of what we're doing. And of course there's also the process of just getting to know one another. Uh, some of us had, had known one another before this, but but uh, in many cases, uh, that's not uh, the case, and so um, that's part of the process as well, understanding what each other is um, uh, thinking. When you talk about the mandates, what are some of the significant powers that the commission has, and what are some of the powers it doesn't have? Um, well, uh, we, power may be the... Uh, the wrong word. We're, I, I yeah. see Responsibility. Us, uh, yeah. That's a terrible word. Yeah, we're Not power. Yeah. Okay. Our, our I like power. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, what, what we are, uh, you know, there are a number of, of actors. Responsibility. In, yeah, sure. there, there are a number of actors with, within the consent decree. So, you know, you have a monitor, you have the mayor, you have city council, you have the chief of police, you've got a training and review committee. There are, are many pieces of this, and the consent decree provides the ways in which all those uh, uh, pieces sort of interact. Um, to accomplish what, what, what needs to be done here. So um, uh, we have a responsibility initially um, as a commission uh, in the first 90 days to assess um, bias-free policing policies here in Cleveland and make recommendations uh, to, the, to the chief of police about um, what policies should be in place. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something that's happening uh, in, in the first 90 days and that we're, we're beginning our work on. And, uh, and then another thing that's sort of time sensitive that we're dealing with is uh, a need to consult with the mayor and city council as they're thinking about drafting an ordinance that would amend the charter of the city uh, to make some changes to the police review board. So um, uh, some of those changes are spelled out in the decree itself. Uh, so for example, the fact that the police review board has to have uh, diversity that represents the community there has to be particular types of training uh, uh, for folks, both the investigators and the people on the, on the review board. So there's some of those things that are built into the consent decree, but then we are free as a commission uh, uh, to look more broadly at the kinds of things that we think are best practices, uh, the things we see across the country and, and other uh, cities. You were chosen because you represent diverse parts of our community, and of course, Steve representing the Cleveland Police Patrolman's Association directly. What is the most important quality you can have as a member of this commission? I think uh, you, you have to be open-minded. You absolutely have to be open-minded because uh, there are two distinct sides to the issue. Um, there are two distinct viewpoints and we do have to compromise. They are hard discussions um, at some point. Um, I think communication is the key. The communication is the key to everything. Um, we have a disconnect. The police department absolutely has a disconnect with the community. Um, that's not because of the men and women that are in the trenches working. That's because that's what we've been given to work with. Um, in other words, in 2003, um, we had almost 1,900 police officers. We had a great um, an active role in the, out in the community, a community policing unit that had 100 people in it. We had bicycle units. Everybody wants to see the cops on the bikes in the, in the parks, right? We had all that in 2003, 
And in 2004, with the stroke of a pen, Jane Campbell downsized the police department by 252 people, which decimated those community policing units. There's not a police officer out there that doesn't want to have a snowball fight with a bunch of kids on the side of the street. I promise you that. Um, we don't have the time to do that because the police officers that you see out there are going from run to run to run to run to run. They don't have the time that's necessary to interact and have those kinds of conversations that are very, very important. We love being able to do that, being, having the time to be able to reach out and, and talk to the kids. And, and there's a huge disconnect with our children. Um, we don't have the helicopter. That helicopter, I'll tell you folks, that helicopter used to land in the, uh, the backyard of the schools on career days. And those kids, first graders, eyes this big, all they want to do is go up and touch that thing. There was positive interaction with the police department back then. Um, the horses, the guys on the bikes, the fire trucks, you know, that stuff is all gone because of budgetary problems. I have a lot of respect for Chief Williams. He is doing the absolute best that he can with the resources that he has. But that's something that we're going to um, talk about very intensely on this, uh, on this commission because we don't have the people. We're down 600 police officers in a three-year period of time from 2003 to 2006. Now I have politicians that are in charge of the city of Cleveland putting their hands in the air and going, hey, what the heck's going on? Why do we have such a disconnect? Well, they're responsible for it. It's not because the guys and, the guys and gals that are out there don't want to do that type of work or that they're mean-hearted or mean-spirited or anything else. It's that they don't have the resources to do that kind of work. And it's very, very important work. You know, um, I, I, I tell this story in every single uh, meeting that I'm at. And I've been to two, three, four sometimes community meetings since December talking to people, sometimes 20 people, sometimes 200. And I tell this story, and I was, I was training a rookie, um, Brian Messer, a very good police officer out in the 4th District. We got a call for 144th and Kinsman because there was kids playing with a basketball pole in the front yard, in the road. And of course, a little old lady that sees everything in the neighborhood is complaining, it's making her nervous. So we go there, and instead of hard timing those kids, and they were a bunch of ankle biters, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, ha just having a good time. And, and, and the police officer on the street says, what the heck is the policy? With, why do they want us to take these basketball poles? So we got out of the car. We, I, I made my rookie take his equipment off, put it in the trunk of the car, and we went and played basketball with those kids for 15 minutes. Had a good conversation with them. They thought it was great. And I promise you, folks, whether they're Harvard graduates or whether they're incarcerated now, they'll never forget the two white cops that got out of that car and had fun with them and didn't hard time them. They'll n and that is what we are absolutely missing right now. And we have to get back to that. Now, it took me, I, I drove about 15 seconds from that run before the little lady was calling the commander and I was on the carpet explaining myself to him. But, you know, it was well worth it. And we got a, a pat on the back and a shake of the hand and the commander was McGrath at the time. You know, out in the fourth district. I, he would have got me beat, so I, <laughs> I thought I'd be um, the the one who would um, command the floor like that. Uh, so thank you for sharing that, Loomis. I think you know I'm gonna echo with uh, what what Loomis and Craig said, and Loomis is used to me calling him Loomis, so it's not disrespectful. It's not, Craig. So Trust me. They, that's you know that's like they call me Dr. Rhonda. So um, openness, communication, um, the ability to look at best practices the ability to investigate and have critical analysis of the issues, the willingness to step outside the box and not do business as usual, the willingness to actually um, know that you're in a situation where um, we are not supposed to be replicating the status quo, we're supposed to be changing things and transforming things, and really to look at how that impacts people on the ground who are the most vulnerable, the most aggrieved, and the most marginalized, and to be able to kind of understand that. In relationship to race, we're going to have to have some hard discussions about race. We're going to have to have some hard discussions about what that means in terms of systems of uh, institutional racism and white supremacy. We're going to have to have some hard conversations about age. We're going to have to have some hard conversations about socioeconomic status. And when we have those hard conversations, that's going to help us really think about bias-free policing, bias-free ordinances. How does that impact not only the GPOs, the general police orders, the training, cultural competency, but also how is that going to impact and how do we actually survey the real outcomes on the ground where people are really feeling that their lives have changed and their relationship with police have changed and that we're in a place where we're not just having better policing, 
but we're in a place where we need less policing and that there is something different that's happening on the ground. So that's, that's where I want to get to. And I think all of us need to be able to really kind of bring those issues together and really open-mindedly have those conversations. Mm -hmm. And we got to be willing to be able to pivot and also move away from our entrenched positions of understanding other people um, and, and what they're going through. And history is absolutely, I'm a historian, absolutely important to this because this is not new. So even in 2003, when Steve gave the wonderful example, um, there were still police community problems. There were still mm -hmm. questions of concerns around police accountability and police brutality. So we've got to really dig into this stuff deeply and come together as a commission and move it forward. How do the rest of us in this room support the 13 of you? How does the community get involved? How do we assist here? Well, I think a, a big part of it is spreading the word. We're having a number of public meetings over the next couple of months, and uh, so getting the word out about that. And, and because part of our role is to, a big part of our role is to uh, gather input from the community so that what we are recommending is informed. Um, and I've just handed the uh, meeting dates, October 28th, um, it's a Wednesday at Elizabeth Baptist Church, November 11th, Wednesday evening at Cadell Recreation Center, December 3rd is a Thursday at Trinity Cathedral, and December 17th is a Thursday at Westside Community House. Uh, so uh, spreading the word. 5.30 to 8.30. Right. But it, for example, the uh, amending the charter uh, to make changes to the police review board, that's something that has to be done by a vote. And so we can make recommendations and work with um, the city council and the mayor to come up with the ordinance that's going to make those kinds of changes. But then it's up to all of you to go to the polls and vote and, uh, and uh, throw your weight behind uh, what we're trying to do and what we're trying to do in the name of uh, and on behalf of the community. Bias free ordinance as well, right? I mean, that's that's something that we want people to really pay attention to, and we actually want advice on um, these policies. So the police review board, if you have advice, if you have visions about how you want to see it work, how it hasn't worked for you, that really helps us to do the kind of critical deep dive assessment we need to do. We want to hear from you, and the same with bias free policing. Like, what is bias free policing to the community? What does that look like? How can we then take that information and think about the general police orders and the procedures and training and cultural competency and then having assessment tools to really see if we're matching and meeting what the community wants. And if I could, can I throw out the phone number? Yep. We have a phone number and a Gmail as well. So our phone number is 216-755-4CPC, 4CPC, 216-755-4CPC. And our Gmail is 216 cpc at gmail.com. So that's how you can reach us um, in the meantime. How much room is there for community involvement to impact how you implement a plan that's already written out? Are you referring to the, the consent decree? To the decree? consent decree. Well, the consent decree, th there are a lot of things that are not provided for in the consent mm -hmm. decree or where community uh, involvement is specifically solicited. Um, but part of our work is going to be informed by the community through work groups. So we have committees that are tackling uh, various parts of, of, of our set of tasks and uh, we will be uh, reaching out to people in the community to engage uh, subject matter experts in things like mental health and, and, and people from the LGBT community and so forth. So uh, those are some of the ways that uh, the community can be involved. But in, in some respects, too, the, the consent decree has made a, a stab at trying to be representative of the community uh, by virtue of the makeup of the selection panel that selected this um, commission and, and by the, the uh, different and diverse views that are represented on the commission itself. Uh, we mentioned earlier that FBI Director James Comey is in Cleveland this week. When we talked to him about policing community at Channel 3, he said it's hard to hate up close. What do you make of that sentiment? That's absolutely the, the truest words that he spoke um, throughout that thing it, it really is and that's that goes right into the community policing and, and having the police officers out there we want them to get out of their cars and engage the community um, and and uh, you know it's it's very very difficult um, when you're so short-handed and, and folks I'm telling you it, it's the union guy up here saying hey we need more cops it's I live in this city I have four kids and two grandkids that I'm raising in this city that also my, my two adult daughters live in this city. And um, I, I don't like what I'm seeing. I don't, as a father, as a resident of the city, I don't like what I'm seeing. As a police officer, I'm horrified at what I'm seeing because 
the violence and the increase and the uptick of everything that's going on right now um, puts my folks in danger, not only the police officers, but the citizens. My daughter uh, and my son-in-law is a police officer. They got their car broken into in West Park. You know, I, I thank God that, that they didn't interrupt that because who knows what happens if they interrupt that. But they got two cars broken into up there. I had cars stolen out of my driveway. I live in Old Brooklyn. Um, it, you know, so it's, I don't like seeing what's going on here, and we have to do something about it. Um, every neighborhood in this city has the majority of the people in that city are absolutely wonderful people, law-abiding, God-fearing. They're absolutely wonderful people. There's not a neighborhood in this city that, that do isn't the majority of folks. Um, we need to send a message out, and I've trained 72 rookies. And our message is, and the police academy's message is, you need to talk to folks like you're talking to your grandmother, all right? Start that conversation out like you're talking to your grandmother, all right? Let them dictate where it's going to go. If it's a bad guy that's a no person and that wants to go to a dark place, then we can follow them there. But let's not start there because that, then we don't have credibility. If we start off as Billy Bad Butt, you know, the, the rookies are tough. It's tough to get them to learn that. That's something that you learn through experience. Um, if we start out with the, the aggressive stance and the, you know, you know what I mean? If we start out with that and then we find out that we're talking to somebody that's wonderful, it's very hard for us to have any credibility in, in walking backwards from that and now we're, now we're the nice guy. It's much different if we start out nice then we find out that the folks that we're dealing with are nice 99.9% .9 of the time, right? And then now we're in a completely different playing, playing field, completely different. I just want to add, so it, it's, yeah, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to hate up close, but it's, um, hate, hate takes place up close too. So when we're talking about what's up close, we have to talk about what is the kind of conversation, what's the substance of what's going on? Um, because because um, we've lost, people in community to police brutality and police violence over the decades, over the generations, and even most recently, up close. So there has to be something about the dynamic up close that's happening differently, mm -hmm. right? The conversation, the willingness to go deep, the willingness to understand that people are human be beings and all of us deserve di dignity and respect. And that police kind of officers things. are human beings. All of us are human beings. Absolutely. That this deserve is where human and dignity and respect. But I didn't, thing. did you hear me exclude yeah. police officers? Did yeah. anyone hear me exclude police uh -huh. officers? <laughs> all people deserve human dignity and respect. All of us deserve to go home at the end of the day, wherever we are, wherever we're moving through. Absolutely. So, so the encounters, I think, are important. And, and we can't, again, we cannot shy away from some of the hard conversations. You know, what often happens is people get defensive when you start to have those hard conversations. People, and, and this is all of us could get defensive at any given time. Mm -hmm. They get their back up, or they don't want to hear it because it may impact some project or proposal or just world view that they have. And we really have to be able to go there, not only as commissioners, but as a city, as a society, to actually move the dial forward. So it's not just about getting up close, it's about how you get up close. Have you been there yet? Are you starting to go there over this last month? You mean with, uh, with each other? Well, just getting into that conversation within oh, the commission. I, yeah, I, I start there. I mean, oh, yeah. they'll tell you. I mean, anybody there. who knows me in the audience know I start there. I mean that. I am a social justice advocate, so mm -hmm. I'm a historian, and I care <laughs> about a future where all lives, all human dignity and respect is in operation. I also care about black lives. I know racism exists. I also care about women's lives. That's why we have to say her name. There are all kinds of issues on the table, age, juvenile issues. We can't deal with, as one of my colleagues calls it, adultification of children. You know, all of these things we have to really begin to have conversations about. So I start there. I mean, I'm a founding director of the Social Justice Institute. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Well, what's happening in Cleveland? How, it, how does that connect to the national dialogue that's also going on about police and community relations? What are the challenges of bringing those two sides together and at the same time maybe being a model for other cities that are going through this very same thing? Well, I, th I think that there are um, uh, a lot of people looking at Cleveland um, to see what, what is going to come of this and how we're going to address this. I mean, we ourselves are looking at, at Seattle and Cincinnati and um, other cities. Um, so there is there's a problem uh, nationally uh, in, in municipalities and cities across the country. 
so we're not alone. But I do think that um, um, given the prominence of Cleveland uh, in the news recently, <coughs> people are looking to see how we're going to address this. And so, um, you know, we're doing a lot of uh, looking at best practices and we're sharing information and communication with folks who have done this in other places. I, I can tell you, um, I have been approached by national media since January. And, and the question, New York Times uh, reporter asked me, what's in the water in Cleveland? You know, and th that's a, it, it's a great testament to everybody in this room that Cleveland doesn't find itself on fire like Ferguson, like Baltimore. Clearly we have some major I nationally known issues, unfortunately, and, and we're part of that national discussion. But the things in Cleveland, and it's a tribute, it's a tribute to the leadership, uh, the, the clergymen, um, the citizen groups out here, it's communication. The chief of police has done a fantastic job in, in communicating. And again, we're back to communicating. You know, why isn't the city of Cleveland burning? Why, when the Ferguson folks came up here um, to protest, they were the first ones that started with the physical stuff. I don't know if you remember, but the van getting pushed around. And what did the Cleveland folks do? I was there. The Cleveland folks came back, all of them, came back on the sidewalk. Their leadership took them on the sidewalk and they started yelling at the folks that were pushing the van around. That's not us. That's not us. Um, Tamir Rice's family makes wonderful statements about we don't need your help. We don't want our city burning. We will take care of our issues in Cleveland. And, and that is a remarkable thing and it, and it is noticed on a national level. Um, uh, Fox News, uh, uh, CNN has been up here. I did an interview with Los Angeles. And the fact of the matter is, is through that communication, I was an undercover detective working in November before I became the president. And they had a march downtown. I probably shouldn't be sharing this, but I'm going to because it's very, very important. I'm, I got a black neoprene mask on, I got an earpiece on, and my job uh, with the other police officers that were in that protest and in that march was to identify leadership, make sure nobody's playing with guns or gasoline or anything crazy, and, and let's make sure that everybody's safe. Everybody's safe. The protesters, the citizens out there, that's my job. We're marching, we're marching, no justice, no peace, you know, F the police, down, we're going downtown. We tell them we're headed to the shoreway. Get some police cars down there to the shoreway, right? Remember when the shoreway got shut down? Um, I'm marching with three people from Denver, Colorado, folks. Denver, Colorado. So I took up the conversation. Hey, what's it like to be able to smoke dope up there, man? The cops up here, I just did three days in jail for having a little bag of weed. What's it like, you know? And we do that thing. And then how did you get here? Well, they send us a, a plane ticket and they give us a hotel voucher and they tell us to get up to Cleveland. Well, who's they? You know, and very, very quickly, the folks, the homegrown Clevelanders, realized that there was a bunch of people that were involved in this that they had their own agendas. Um, Revcom.us, look it up. Revcom.us, Revolutionary Communist Party of America, is financing a lot of this stuff. It's on all their signs. Um, they have no, they don't care about Tamir Rice or anything else that's going on in Cleveland. They wanted, they want to, to create an unrest situation. This is one of those moments again that, yep. uh, that, that <laughs> Steve talked about. So, uh, so I'm, I, I wasn't with you marching and in, in, in getting um, investigative materials to help police uh, protesters and whatnot to, to kind of understand that dynamic. But, but I do know that I, I have also been involved with people from out of, outside of community here, outside of Cleveland, who come here and support of people in the ground who are the most marginalized, aggrieved, and vulnerable to really have some transformative impact to support nonviolent civil disobedience, to support the right to protest, to support the right to be engaged in community, whether they're from Black Lives or from Baltimore or came down from Chicago or up from Cincinnati or wherever they have come in from. So to presume, one of the things I don't want to leave on the table is to presume that everybody who comes into a community to help people in community who are there asking for their help. And there have been different groups asking for their help. And, and the Tamir Rice family actually has asked for help over color of, you know, color of change .com for, and, and gotten 60 to 75,000 signatures on a petition. So there, there's the dialogue between the local and the national in terms of trying to, trying to get help. Um, and that one of the things I think is important in terms of just how um, Loomis and I are talking about this is that you see 
in the way that we're talking about it, the kinds of things that we're going to have to deal with in terms of making sure that we bring about better community police relations, that people on the ground who are exercising their constitutional right to protest don't feel like they're being um, uh, surveilled in a way that takes them back to COINTELPRO as a historian of the 1960s, right? And so we have to really be able to have these hard conversations and say, you know, what's, you know, various people will define what's appropriately differently, but let's have that conversation um, about that. Dr. Rhonda, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Time for some mid-break announcements here, and then we would love to hear your questions. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dan Maltrip, Chief Executive here at the City Club, also a member. It's, we're enjoying a panel conversation today on ensuring the success of the Cleveland Consent Decree. Our panelists are three members of that 13-member Cleveland Community Police Commission. They are Craig Boyce, Dean of the Cleveland Marshall College of Law at Cleveland State University, Steve Loomis, President of the Cleveland Police Patrolmen's Association, and Dr. Rhonda Williams, Founder and Director of the Social Justice in Institute at Case Western Reserve University, also an Associate Professor of History at Case Western Reserve University. WKYC anchor Sarah Shookman is moderating for us, and thank you very much. We encourage you to organize your questions for our speakers now and remind you that your questions should be brief, to the point, and actually questions, not speeches. We understand this is a, a, a a topic that inspires a lot of passion, and we appreciate all of you being here and participating in this dialogue. If you're joining us via radio or via our web stream, you're invited to tweet a question at the City Club, and we will do our best to work it into the conversation. We welcome all of you here and those of, uh, those of you joining us via our radio broadcast and web stream, which is provided by our primary media partner, 90.3 WCPN, WBIZ PBS, 104.9 WCLV Idea Stream, or one of the many other radio stations across the region and country that carry City Club programs. Production and distribution and broadcast of the City Club programs are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Be sure to join us next Friday, October 23rd, as we welcome Dr. Peter Capelli from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania for a conversation on the costs and benefits of a college education. He's actually going to answer the question, is college worth it? For more information about our upcoming and past forums, please visit us online at cityclub.org. Our community partners for today's forum are Cuyahoga Place Matters, Facing History and Ourselves, the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland, and the Chandra Law Firm. We thank you for your partnership. Also, we welcome students today from Shaw High School. Student participation is made possible by a generous grant from the Laub Foundation. Thank you very much for your support. Now it's time to return to our panel for the traditional City Club Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are our Director of Programming, Stephanie Jansky and our marketing and outreach fellow, Faye Walker. Our first question, please. I have a vague recollection that in 1993 or 1994, there was a prior consent decree. A further vague recollection that there was community conversation, recommendations made, recommendations essentially rejected, little or no change made. Dean Boys, I heard you say that one of your many responsibilities or outcomes will be to make recommendations to the police regarding policies, procedures, and best practices. What is your authority to move from conversation to mandate a change? So apart from just um, making recommendations about policies that should be in place, changes that should be made to policies that exist, that sort of thing, we, we all signed on for a four-year uh, term. Um, and, and so beyond the immediate stuff that, that, uh, that we're dealing with right now, on an ongoing basis, it's our responsibility to also look at uh, the way that the Division of Police is responding uh, to our recommendations and to work very closely with the monitor uh, in evaluating whether or not these things are working. So this is not a, a situation where we expect to simply uh, put something on the books and, uh, you know, um, dust our hands off and, and move on. This is something that, that requires monitoring. That's why there is a, a monitor, and we're going to be very much involved in that process. And if I could just jump in and, and piggyback on what um, Craig said, um, ditto everything that Craig said. But one of the things I would say, though, in answer to your question is that um, we are tasked with making recommendations. We, we do not have the authority and power to have them implemented through the commission itself. That is going to have to happen in conversation, dialogue, with good faith, um, with community engagement, community will. Um, for that to actually happen uh, in the Cleveland Division of Police. There will be some things like the drafting of new policies and procedures that we will have some control over um, and, um, and uh, in terms of recommending them to the Chief of Police. 
but the consent decree does not give us the authority to implement. And so that's why we need to have community engaged. That's why we need to build the relationships. That's why we need to have the kind of deep conversation so that we can actually get to that place of implementation. And as Craig said, the monitor is going to be important and the surveys that we do and the annual reports that we do as well is going to be important in terms of looking at real impact on the ground. What are the real outcomes? How has it moved from policy to impacting real people's lives? And they feel it. And so in four years, we will be doing that as well, thinking about I that. I understand that the, the uh, structure of this, the consent decree is a court order, and a federal judge has signed off on that and will be monitoring the extent to which the parties, the DOJ, the city, are complying with the responsibilities under the consent decree. Uh, so there is that additional thing, and that's not been present, I think, in, in, in the past. <laughs> Next question. Yes, uh, is a special effort going to be made to reach out to the immigrant foreign born community because I think it's going to take a little extra nudging for lack of a better word in that area because these people oftentimes don't speak English and they're afraid to come forward because if they didn't dot the I or cross the T on their visa, they're scared to death they're gonna be deported. Um, I would say I'd jump in and if um, Loomis and, and Craig wanna jump in, but one of our commissioners, uh, Max Rodas, um, has already, um, as are many of us, already talking about this, already making sure that um, in the work that we do, we are re re uh, reaching out to diverse communities. Um, we are trying to figure out how we could get translation, res resources for translation of, of documents, of even translation during our meetings, um, also for differently abled persons um, as well. And so these are things that we really wanna focus on, and most definitely immigrant, foreign-born community, and really understanding their particular status, um, some of them as undocumented and what that may mean in terms of being very careful and also very still open and protective of them as we do this work so that their voices are not lost. That's part of that marginalized, exploited, most vulnerable communities that we have to pay attention to. Thanks. Thank you to all of you for serving on this very necessary uh, body, okay? Uh, thank you particularly to Mr. Loomis for serving on the front lines in the street. Uh, I appreciate that. We appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Loomis, uh, I, I want you to speak to the perception in the street that, you know, respectfully, you uh, may be more of the problem here. Now, I like you. I like what I've heard from you today. You, you feel to me like a likable guy. Um, and I'm serious about that. Uh, now, the larger perception in the street is that you are always primarily concerned about the image of police officers or the interests of police officers. Now, that's fine. Someone needs to be looking out for that. But I asked you to talk about how that relates to your concern for uh, the citizens of Cleveland mm -hmm. and their safety and their well-being, particularly when they're engaging or engaged by police officers. Now, I believe that you have a primary role here in changing the culture in this city. You are very important to this process. So my particular question to you is what can you do that you haven't done to change the perception of you personally and to change the perception of, of the entrenched police interests here, which, which always seem to be on the defense as Dr. Williams said. Mm -hmm. Well, th thank you very much for your comments. Um, my wife thinks I'm a likable guy too, so I guess I'm, <laughs> I'm lucky in that aspect. I, I l listen, it goes right back to communication. It go perception's a very, very um, um, challenging word um, because perception is not reality. I hate that saying. Perception is reality. It's not reality. Reality is reality. And the way that we improve the perceptions out there is through the communication. Um, we, uh, part of the, uh, by the way, we, we submitted um, to the Department of Justice about 12 different items um, that we believe would have been helpful. Not one of them was entertained by the Department of Justice. That's a whole nother program, all right? Um, but some of the perceptions we're trying to address through that, the, the people want um, there are mini stations back. Remember the mini stations, right? We had the mini stations, the cops out there, the community policing officers, and the mini stations. It's astronomical expense for the city. So we suggested 
that we use buildings, city buildings that are already in place. Grammar schools specifically, libraries, rec centers, put an office in there. The mayor could do it with a stroke of a pen. Mandate that we have an office in there for Cleveland police officers. And Rhonda and I are partners. and We have routine reports to do. She can go do the reports and I'm out glad handing with the kids in a positive interaction. Um, that's one of the suggestions and it's very, very cheap for the city to do. And, it, and we believe that it moves towards the goal that we all have. Um, very hard to change people's minds without getting right in front of them and talking to them. Um, if it's perceived that I'm here, you know, I, I, I get the emails. I, I, and I answer the emails too. Um, if it's perceived that every cop is um, innocent, you know, um, that's not the reality. I have a police officer that's in jail right now that we're not doing anything with. If there's a policeman that is committing crimes out there, and I mean committing crimes, selling dope, robbing dope boys, um, anything, if they're committing crimes, I will be the first one to put the cuffs on them because I don't want that guy there uh, or gal there. And we have some gals that get in some trouble too. I don't want them there. Um, I will tell you this, we have the 10%, the 10 percenters, all right? We all have to deal with the 10 percenters. 10% 10 of society are the, are the repeat offenders. 10% of my membership of the Cleveland Police Department are the guys that I have to deal with all the time, all the time. 90% of the folks I don't even know uh, you know, on a face-to-face -face basis. There's a lot of young guys out there. I have to deal with the guys that get in trouble, all right? Our job, my job as the president of the union is to assure due process to these guys. Um, we, we just had a guy uh, indicted for um, some sex crimes stuff. I, I mean, it's horrifying to me, horrifying. We didn't lift a finger for that guy. I haven't paid not one dime for his defense. I didn't point him in the right direction of a defense attorney, nothing. You know, I, that embarrasses me and that, that causes us great angst because our profession is being labeled nationwide by a few acts, controversial acts, um, and not, by, my, not by the majority of the good works that these men and women do on a daily basis, folks. Um, one of the things that, that we're going to have a discussion about is with regards to OPS, the Office of Professional Standards. They, you know, they want... It's very easy for people to file a complaint. What it's not easy to do is for you to file a compliment because a compliment goes a long way with a bunch of men and women that see absolutely negative things day in and day out, 10 hours a day. You know, we pick the, we pick the profession, we understand that, but it doesn't take away from the fact that most of the things that we're involved in are, are very, very negative, very, very hard to, to have a, a highlight reel, you know? We pulled a, a, a young Hispanic lady off the bridge by the bun on the top of her hair. Thank God she had the bun on the top of her hair because her butt was over the edge and she was going. And there was police officers that looked away because they didn't want to see the look on her face as she was falling. And my partner got a hold of her hair and I got a hold of her arm through the gate and she sat there hanging, dangling, all right? That's a career moment. That's something that I'll, I'll never forget. That's something that young lady will never forget. That's something you guys didn't hear about, right? You know, we got to do a much better job of getting the positive stuff out there. And that's all part of the communication. And that'll change the perceptions. I hope mm -hmm. that'll change the perceptions. So that was a question to Loomis. I got to jump in. That was a question to, um, to Loomis. But one of the things that, that I want to say is that um, perception is really complicated. And to say that perception is not reality is not, uh, is not taking as nuanced a stance as we can um, in terms of really understanding if people really perceive something to be and they're acting on that perceive something to be, then that perceives something to be becomes reality. And then there's also the reality that the perceptions or the picture conveys to us. And so these are also some of the things that I think that we really need to, to talk about. And do we sometimes too easily dismiss things as perceptions, as not reality, when in fact they really are um, reality? You know, one of the things that, um, and I just have to mention this, even though that's, this is not kind of what we're talking about now, but, but Loomis mentioned the, um, the mini station. And so this is a conversation he and, he and I have already begun to have, like, well, if you're gonna have many stations and communities, like where would they be? And do communities then feel that their communities are gonna become militarized zones if you're having them in the grammar schools and the rec centers and all over the place? I mean, in all of those spaces, like, can there be places in community though where you can have the, the community-oriented, problem-oriented policing where there's the interface that can happen? But in that moment, you have to be really careful about perception and reality, right? I mean, you know, once you start putting police 
presence in every single space, then for some, that's not gonna feel like community-oriented, problem-oriented policing. That's gonna feel like community being, again, overtaken by police. So, so these are the kinds of conversations that- You can't then, have it both ways, right? though. Yeah, well, we can. You can't have we it can. both ways. You can have, I, many, you can have listen, many stations without them being in gonna, every single place. I'm going to tell you, there's not a grammar school so kid gonna, in the world that would not yeah, like to see a police officer. I wouldn't officer. want it in my grammar school. I wouldn't have wanted it in my grammar school growing up. Well, but but that, that, see, this is the kind of stuff that's going to happen. In those then. rooms, you're getting a picture of it right now. And we actually, but we have these conversations. Mm -hmm. And he calls me Dr. Ron, and I call him Lulu. And we're going to try to develop the best practices and policies that's going to impact and, and, and really build everybody's lives into a, a protective and a serving and a problem-oriented relationship kind of picture that is really gonna have impact for real people on the ground. But I just wanted to say Absolutely, that. I agree with that. So you're, you're already starting to see the way that our individual personalities are <laughs> uh, informing this. And, uh, uh, and you know, for my part, I wanna speak just to the 10% the, the uh, uh, comment that, that Steve made. Um, having been a police officer, I was a police officer for five years in Kansas City, Missouri. I was a field training officer. I trained three recruits, not 72 or whatever. Uh, I was also in the tactical response unit, so I have some experience with this. And my view is it's unacceptable for there to be a serial 10% of the police department is out there violating people's constitutional rights. And so a very big priority for me is that we've got to figure out how to get rid of the bad apples. And I think Steve uh, acknowledges that there are bad apples. I think one of the pressing questions and one of the questions that bothers a lot of people in the community is why are these police officers still in the department? Mm. So Yeah, I yeah. agree. And the other thing, the, the other thing just to I piggyback agree. on what Craig said and, and, and Loomis who's agreeing is that, again, remember that philosophical foundational point I started with from the beginning, and that is that the consent decree actually found a pattern and practice of excessive use of force and unconstitutional policing, which actually in some ways counter the notion of just being having a single bad apple that they're there are individuals that we need to deal with, as Craig said, in terms of the 10% or whatever the number is, but there's also the institutional systemic practices that are part of the culture. And that's where we actually have to begin to dig deep to transform the kind of culture. And then we will begin to see, hopefully before then, but begin to see some real impact and transformative change on the ground. For me, the word is transformative, it's not reform. I want transformation. Next question. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Anthony Price, and I'm a senior at Shaw High School. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my question is pertaining to how can teams uh, become involved, if possible, with the decree and having conversation, those hard conversations within their community and letting them know that there is a consent decree? <laughs> Dean Boyce, well, I think, everyone's um, looking at you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I think that the most direct way is that as we form working groups to deal with various issues, whether it's the police review board, whether it's the bias free policing, or any one of the many other uh, areas that we could address under our um, uh, prescribed responsibilities as a commission, uh, we'll be reaching out to the community. And, and in fact, um, some of the members of our, uh, of our commission are uh, not teenagers, but much closer to being teenagers than some others of us. And, uh, <laughs> And, and we value that, that, that viewpoint and that perspective, and uh, so we certainly want to engage. And I would say, uh, you know, one of the things that the consent decree um, uh, does require is that we establish these district policing uh, committees. And uh, so that's a, an opportunity within the, each of the districts for people to get involved with their district and to begin to build those relationships and, and heal some of the uh, damage that's, that's happened. I'm in with, with Craig and say that he mentioned the district um, police committees, that um, they already exist in the five districts, and so we are tasked with working with them to make them more effective and more expansive and that they look like the diverse communities in which they operate, so that's one. And as Craig said, we also have these, our full regular commission meetings are open to everyone, and we would love to also have youth voices there on a consistent basis to provide comment, because at the end of each one of these regular meetings, we have actually provided for 30 minute comment period. We're trying to model transparency and accountability and community voice in everything we do. We're also, though we haven't announced it yet, but we're also working on um, having the monthly community forums. And those will be opportunities where we actually kind of sit back and listen and we get the community really sharing with us the things that we need to learn for the recommendations that we need to make, but also what we need to know 
as we move towards that broader mandate of community problem-oriented policing and building trust, legitimacy, and confidence in the police force. So that's another thing. I would say the, the other thing Craig mentioned was the working groups, and we would love to have community involved in that as well, experts, non-experts, non-commissioners. But if there is something that you want to set up as a young person, as, as you know, around juvenile issues, around juvenile justice issues. I know there are others who are very concerned about this as, uh, concerned about this as well. The, the, the Schubert Center for Child Studies at Case Western Reserve University even pr uh, did a brief um, uh, that was included in the Mika's brief um, as part of concerns around these kinds of issues. Um, we, I think, would be open to maybe coming out, doing presentations. I mean, you know, We'll figure out when we sleep later, but we we, we probably will be open <laughs> to doing something like that. I don't want to put my commissioners sure. on the spot, but well, the, the what do you think? If you want to get involved, the, the 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 quickest way to get involved is to get in touch with whatever police district you mm -hmm. live in, and ask the commander. Ask for the you can walk in there. The 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 officers there, the OIC, the commander is there, and he'll put you in contact with those specific groups. Um, that's the quickest way to get involved, and then. You know, if you want to give us a call and put something together, we'd be—I'm sure—we would be more than happy to to entertain whatever thoughts you guys might have. And as, as we move forward, too, um, uh, you know, we're really operating at a skeleton level here in terms of our staffing and support, but that will change. Uh, the consent decree provides that we have a budget um, that's uh, covered by the city, and so as we begin to ramp up and provide more infrastructure for our work. Uh, a lot of that's going to involve research and analysis, uh, looking at data, and so it's a great opportunity for uh, students or high school or college students to also be engaged with mm -hmm. us in that work. Next question. Hi, I'm Kim Foreman from Environmental Health Watch, and I'm on the Place Matters team. My question is about training and um, specific to bias, and how are you addressing bias with new people coming in, as well as people have been on the force, because if you don't start there, how can you actually deal with biases in your training? And this is unspoken, unheard, and then an incident happened, and you never knew how an uh, officer might have looked at a person, a particular <coughs> um, community, because once you put on a uniform, you're in a position of power. Yeah, absolutely, and, it, and, and I'll tell you folks, it is an absolute, awesome power and by awesome I don't mean good I mean very very heavy um, in fact I'm, I'm dressed like this today not to stand out up here but I'm leaving from here and going to a graduation ceremony for 31 recruits that are that are getting sworn in today by the mayor um, and and I'll tell you this is the first day that they're wearing their their guns and that gun weighs 150 pounds on them right now it's our job as senior police officers to to get them through that is a learning curve I can't even explain it to you but to get them through that um, as, as safely as possible and, and I'll go right back to one of our recommendations what and I work with uh, uh, Mr. Denahan on this um, we recommended that an additional five weeks be attached to the end of the police academy the first week for CIT training crisis intervention which is excellent excellent training it's a week-long program and I have not had one police officer tell me that it was it was a waste of time. Um, 600 of our guys have gone through it so far. The chief is doing a good job of trying to backfill. I said, put them through that, the police academy. The police academy, this academy class was the first one that went through that training, all right? But along with that training, you have to have a little bit of experience. So we went a, a step farther and said, four weeks of um, scenario-based training. Let's see, we do a really good job in the police academy of tell, uh, teaching these guys how to use the police voice, how to, how to be tactically sound, how to get home at night, police voice, you know, deal with the no person. What we do a terrible job of is teaching people how to talk to people, mm -hmm. okay? And the only way that you can do that, in, in, in my opinion, is to put that into the academy right off the bat and, and four weeks of, of scenario-based training, all right? It's logistically, it's tough to do. The chief, the chief hates it. The budget, you know, Sharon Dumas will hate it. The budget people will hate it because you can only do four, four cadets at a time, you know. But Loomis can go in there and be a great violent mental male. Let's see what these four kids are going to do with that. And then Bill Denahan and his crew are going to be up on the catwalk critiquing what they do. And then Bill, Mr. Denahan, is going to come down and explain to the guys how they could have better dealt with that situation. You know, you get me? 
And then next week, maybe it's Rape Crisis Center that's up there and, and watching us deal with taking a, a sexual assault complaint, which is very, very delicate. I mean, that's the most heinous, aside from murder, that's the most heinous crime that's out there. And, and we do a terrible job of teaching these guys how to, how to be sensitive about that and how to ask the appropriate questions in the appropriate way. You know, um, we asked for four weeks of that, and the sky is the limit as to what practical training you could have done. Hands-on, um, um, scenario-based training is the best way to learn for these guys. And um, that got summarily d uh, dismissed. You know, they didn't entertain that. So, um, How does that impact officers that are already on the force? What, the training? How do you bring in some of that training to officers that are already we, on the force? We have... Um, I know you mentioned the CIT training, yeah. which is significantly talked about in the consent decree. Yep, and, and the problem that we have is that we have to, you have to take guys off the street to go to that for a week. So, and, and, and I started out my comments very early that we're operating with the skeleton crew, so it's very, very difficult for the chief to take 100 guys off the street and send them to this fantastic training. So we do it, you know, 10 at a time, is it, Bill? You know, 10 at a time they're doing it. So we're going to get there eventually. And then we have an annual in-service training. Um, and, and that's about, that can be anywhere from three days to a week long um, where we have to shoot our, we have to shoot Chapter 10 to make sure everything is okay um, with that. But then it could be anything, any type of training that the chief, the safety director, um, the mayor decides that we need to, to have, that's an opportunity for them to do that. And, and they do, they do a nice job with that. I think we have to wrap it up on that note. Uh, obviously, there is so much more to say about this conversation. You've been enjoying a panel discussion on ensuring the success of the Cleveland Consent Decree. Craig Boys, Dean of the Marshall College of Law, Steve Loomis, President of the Cleveland Police Patrolmen's Association, and Dr. Rhonda Williams, the Founder and Director of the Social Justice Institute at Case Western Reserve University. Thank you to all of our panelists today. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here. The forum <laughs> is now adjourned. <laughs>